There was a man called of God, chosen to be one of the fathers. And whenever he was returning to the land of promise, he wrestled with a man until the dawning of the day. And he said to that man when he was told, let me go. He says, no, I'll not let you go until you bless me. Yeah. Now it's written at the beginning of this book, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written therein for the time is at hand. So brethren, what we're doing in this gathering in a, a manner of speaking is we're wrestling, not against the Lord, we're wrestling with the Lord Amen. until he give us the blessing contained in these words. Amen. So as Brother Given comes, uh, we, we have that in mind, that these are written to all believers and that there's a blessing in it. Yeah. Amen. Jesus assesses churches. And he even assesses believers when they're scattered. He assesses them. Churches, I talk about churches. Now the scriptures contain some epistles and words where Jesus assessed, evaluated, critiqued, however you want to say it. Churches. It was the uh, churches at Rome and Corinth and Philippi and Colossae, and Ephesus, Thessalonica. Then in the Revelation, there was Ephesus and Smyrna, and Pergamos and Thyatira, and Sardis and Laodicea. And Jesus evaluated these churches. I emphasize this. These are churches that he evaluated. I don't know what would happen today if anybody assessed a church. I, I don't think it would be very well received. But it needs to be done. So I'm going to be dealing with what Jesus found out about the church in Ephesus. And the text is Ephesians 2, and I'm going to begin at verse 6. Under the angel of the church at Ephesus, that's the messenger. Now, I want to make a point here. You notice he didn't address it to the elders. Does any, did anybody notice that? I, you know, when... Uh, Paul wrote to the Philippians, he wrote to the brethren with the elders, not to the elders with the brethren. So I just kind of helped you to kind of straighten out your, straighten out your thinking. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? See, there's, every church has some messenger, some premier messenger. People may not like it, but that's the way it is. He may not be the most educated person there. He may be too. It's a message. Oh, here's what I tell the. I want the messenger to tell the church this, and that assumes they're going to be gathered together. They're not going to send letters out to their homes. To the angel of the church at Ephesus, write: I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them that are evil. I say maybe that's a correct reading. Yeah. Thou canst not bear. We dedicate this to all the people feel sorry for sinners. We, we, dedicate, that. we yeah. dedicate this to them. Canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars and hast borne and has patience. And for my name's sake has labored and not fainted. Has not fainted. <laughs> would be nice to end in the end there. Wouldn't that be, that'd be a high note? It'd be a high note. That'd, that'd make the headlines in the church journals. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, yeah. Yeah. 
I have somewhat against thee. This is Jesus talking. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. <laughs> well, what do you hate, you know? Jesus takes note of what you hate. <laughs> it's in the Bible, it's in the Bible quote from Jesus. So let's look at this uh, Jesus assessment of Ephesus. I know, I know what's going on there. I know the status of that group. This is a group. Now this is a group. You will never hear anybody talk about church, a church as a whole. It's not done today. It's not fashionable. The TV preachers don't do it, and the local preachers don't do it. They do not talk about churches as a whole. But Jesus does. And Paul did. And John and Peter did. He didn't ask who their preacher was. He assessed the whole church. So what did he, uh, what did he find? Well, their, their deficiency, and I'll, I'll name it here and we'll develop it. Their deficiency was they left their first love. He didn't say they lost their first love. He said they left. Now, what did that involve, leaving their first love? What did that mean? It mean they fell. That's what he says, you had fallen. Ephesus had fallen. It said they fell left their first love. See, the, uh, in my estimation, the greatest danger we face today in Christendom is powerless religion. Amen. It's all over the place. Amen. In fact, I, I don't know where it's not. Mm -hmm. Powerless Religion, that's religion where they left the first love. Because you can't love Jesus and be powerless. That, yeah. Let's just settle this right now. Yeah. You can't have a close identity with Jesus and be powerless. See, but the modern church is, in fact, powerless. Yeah. That's the reason it has its Bible colleges, its seminaries, its consultation with the world, its motivators, its fundraisers. That's why it's got all that stuff. Because the church today... As a whole, there are exceptions, I understand this, with a very, apparently very small percentage. The reason they are relying on all these ancillary helps is because they're powerless. They, can't, they don't have enough power to correct behavioral malfunctions in their church, so they hire somebody to come and recover of people. I'm assuring, affirming that that is because they've left their first love. If they, I'm not sure some of these places ever did have a first love. Ephesus did have a first love. It was a strong uh, church. Ephesus was the city, you remember, where Paul started out in the synagogue and they didn't, they didn't like it, so he left. And that's what the apostles did, what Jesus did. You didn't like it, they just left. Uh -huh. yeah. They just left. That was it. They didn't stay, they left. Yeah. You, don't re you don't like Jesus, he leaves. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And uh, he moved to a, the school of Tyrannus, I guess it's something like a public auditorium. And he be commenced to teach there, and as a result, all Asia heard the word of God. One, yeah. one man yeah, had power. Uh, yeah. He loved Christ. Yes. Amen. We know from Scripture that he forsook every competing interest. Any, yeah. If it butted heads with Jesus, he dunged it. Yeah. Yeah. He got rid of it. Amen. He had a fine religious career. 
top of the line as far as the Jews were concerned, and this was a chosen nation, yeah. revealed religion, God-given law, see? And he was at the top. But when he drew close to Jesus, he drew away from, see, when you closer you get to Jesus, a kind of a distance begins to form between you and other com competitors. Amen. So the church in Ephesus left their first love. That's a deficiency that he found. And he, he's writing them about it. And the, now the jeopardy they faced was if this thing wasn't corrected, they would sever their union. He would sever his union with that church. Yeah. Yeah, that's, how serious, that, that's how serious we're talking about here. I mean, he might have his name on the billboard outside and all such stuff as that. But if that, if that wasn't corrected, this thing of, your, of leaving your first love, if that wasn't corrected, there wouldn't going to be any recognized church in Ephesus anymore. That's the jeopardy they faced. <coughs> this is the result of leaving their their first love. Now let's look at the, they had fought, he said, he said uh, you left your first love. Some of the other versions accept this, says you, you, for, you have forsaken your first love. The uh, New Revised Standard Version says you abandoned. <laughs> to embrace this, you left that standing over there. You abandoned your first love. Basic Bible English says you turned away from you turned away from the first love. One Bible, the Holman Bible says you let go of your first love. And then that Bible says you departed, departed from your first love. See, this, these are all deliberate. And the New Jerusalem Bible says you have less love. Now, as I mentioned, what is what does it involve to leave your first love? What does that involve? He said in verse 5, remember from whence thou has fallen. So leaving your first love involves falling. Yeah. And you can't find anything good about falling in the Bible. That's right. Amen. Every place you read about falling in the Bible, they mean to scare you. Yeah. They dropped away. They became inefficient. They left the course. They left the path. They yeah. got off the highway. People in that state leaving their first love, they're in a dangerous state. They've got to repent. Repent is more than just something in your mind. Amen. Repent is a, not only a change of thinking, it's a change in conduct. I mean, Jesus won't even receive people initially unless they repent. They got to change their conduct before they come in. <laughs> That's what John the Baptist said. That's what Peter said, repent, then be baptized. Change of conduct. Got to repent. They had to do the first works. Or so I do the first works. Be like you were at the beginning. Do the first works. See, a church can do all the things found in Ephesus and yet not love Jesus. Yeah, amen. Then we go over them again. They could not bear those that were evil. That's a plus. He commended them for that. They tested people and said they were apostles and they found out they weren't apostles at all. They had borne. That means they held up under heavy burdens. They weren't stumbling and bumbling all the time. There was, a, there was a sense in which they were consistent. They held up under heavy burdens, under heavy tests, they held up. They had patience, yeah. perseverance or constancy yeah. or endurance. You see, there's some, some people never have had this. <laughs> there's a lot of Christians that never have had this. Ephesus had it. And when he wrote this word to them, they still had it. They were constant. They hadn't fainted. 
They didn't grow weary. Every once in a while, I hear Christians talk about fainting, how they fainted. Yeah. they just give up. I say, I don't feel, I hope you don't judge me, but I don't feel sorry for people like that. They're quitters. You could be in the shape of Ephesus and not quit. Got no use for quitters. Uh uh. Do you ever been tempted to quit? Yes. Reject that temptation. Amen. Amen. Ephesus, they weren't quitters, they didn't grow weary. And beside that, they hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans said, look, if you got the desire, go ahead and do it. The desire came from God, so if you want to do it, just do it. He said, now you, uh, he didn't say, and I, I hand this, so you tried to convert the Nicolaitans. Now, that's, not what he, that's not what he said. He said, you hated the deeds, what these people did. You're going to help any sinner, you've got to hate what they're doing. This is the plus for them now. You hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So that's this is what Jesus found now. Jesus evaluated. <clears throat> and then he published it. <laughs> he let the whole world know what he found. Why? Well, I can't begin to imagine if Jesus evaluated the churches of our fair city and on Saturday night sent out Michael and then Gabriel to put on the marquee what Jesus found. Well, you'd have signs said, he's not here. But Jesus does do this. He evaluates whole churches. See, there are some churches, I don't respect them, and I don't apologize for it. They only meet once a week, and not for long. If Jesus was a person, he would tell you that, how, how come you meet once a week and your light's not shining the rest of the week? Jesus evaluated. See, the, you read these things that he said, you can't bear those that are evil. You tested those that said they were apostles and found they weren't. You held up under burdens. You were steadfast. You persevered. You didn't grow weary. And you hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. See, there's a lot of people, they're not, any, they're not anywhere near that. And this is a church Jesus criticized. He said, I have something against you. Would you like him to say that to you? you better, if you don't want him to, you better not be having stuff that he doesn't like in your life. If it's a whole church, they better get straightened out. I want to underscore that he announced this to the whole world. Now for 2,000 years, the whole world's known what the church at Ephesus was like. There are roughly 160 churches in Joplin. I don't really know how, what any of them are like. But Jesus does. And I think it's possible for him to let you know what they're like, like he did here. Let the whole world know. He had to repent and do the first works. That's what he told him. You have to repent. You've got to stop not loving me. You said, well, how do you know whether you, whether you love Jesus or not if you do what he says? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he's got a parcel, a whole parcel of commandments. Now, this church at Ephesus was not in uh, good condition at all. What, what, what did he say? What's the jeopardy they faced? Do we know what, what the condition was? They had a lot of pluses, but they were little pluses. <laughs> All these pluses were offset by this one minus. Yeah. This one minus negated everything else. Yeah. Hmm? 
Jesus, I'll come, I'll come quickly. I'll surprise you. I'll come quickly and I'll remove your <coughs> candlestick. Where was Jesus standing? In the midst of the candlesticks. Yeah. He was standing in the midst of the candlesticks. He said, if you don't repent, you won't be one of these I'm standing in the midst. I'll, I'll eliminate you from my churches that I stand in the midst of, whose messengers I hold in my hand. It'd be removed out of its place. Living Bible says, be removed from its place among the churches. So when the churches are tallied up, this man was born there, Ephesus wouldn't be tallied. Is that it? That's pretty serious stuff. This is the church now we're talking about. We're not talking about one or two people. We're talking about an entire body of people. No light will emit from this church. If Jesus removes the candlestick, there's no light coming out from this. Now you tell me, are there churches from whom no light is emitting? If there are, could it be that Jesus has taken them off the list? Something to think about. You can't pass final judgment on this, I know, but it's, people have to think about have to think about this. They would no longer be, be classified as one of Christ's churches. Uh, there were some places like that that Jesus called synagogues of Satan. <laughs> There are some churches that are actually gathering points for Satan's people. But the marquee says it's a church. And they hire an official man they call a minister. They have a church staff. All kind of this ministry is in that ministry. But see, what I want to know is what's Jesus think about that church? Because they're thinking about what we think about that church. The union with Christ would be severed. Now Jesus uh, spoke about this same type of thing to the Jews when he was here upon earth. The things of God were in their charge. They had the law of God, they had the ordinances of God, you know, they had all of this and they were custodians of all of this. And they did a bad job. They, they weren't doing a good job at all. And here's what Jesus uh, said to them. Therefore I say unto you, this is to the Jewish people, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now, I insist that some people have no idea that this is how Jesus is. If he's given you something, whether you're an individual or, a, or an entire church, he's talking about entire churches. He's not talking about Mary and John and so forth. He's talking about entire churches. The entire church at Ephesus. He talked to the whole body of Jews. He said, all right. You have not been doing well in representing me to the world. So I'm going to take away the kingdom of God from you. You're, you're not going to have anything from me anymore. And I'm going to give it to some other nation, in this case the Gentiles. I'm going to give it to them because they're going to bring forth some fruit. Now listen to me. There are some churches that have closed up because they've been bad stewards. And God just shut them down. Oh, you have to people. I was uh, the coordinator of church relations in a local school. Every week, I got at least 50 letters of churches that closed. 
And for every mega church that rose up, a hundred other ones closed up. And the mega church didn't do half what those other churches theoretically were doing. And I used to wonder, how come all these churches are closing? It'd be phenomenal. You'd be, you'd be surprised. I did a uh, study, and I, I don't particularly like that word study, but I did a study from the years 1942 to 1992, 50 years. And I analyzed the Brotherhood Rags publications. The number of people that were in the churches the number of churches there were, and the number of baptisms they reported in a year, 1942 to 1992. I graphed it all out. In 1992, and this is just Restoration Movement churches, 1992 had thousands of churches less than 1942. In all those years, there was an accumulated increase of 10,000 people. But that wasn't very good because nobody ever reported people that left the church or that died <laughs> or that fell away. That was never reported. They transferred from church A to church B. Church B reported they picked up one, but church A never said they lost one. So the 10,000, it probably was a really a minus 10,000. Back in 1942, up until the mid-50s, and I participated in some of these revival meetings where we would have hundreds of baptisms. Brother Archie Ward, which a lot of you brother know, he used to line up the people being baptized on the steps of the church. There'd be two, three hundred. At every revival meeting, I personally participated in a revival meeting with the president of Minnesota Bible College, I was 19 years old. I was the song leader. We didn't have praise leaders in those days. And we had 50 baptisms in Beardstown, Illinois. And Jerry Gibson was his name. He was the president of Minnesota Bible College. He said, Gavin, we're not going to report this. We're not going to, re we're not going to report this because it's too humiliating to have only 50 baptisms and everybody else is reporting hundreds. So we didn't report it. Today. You will never, in your lifetime, read of a church that had 50 baptisms. See, so, something, I'm, I'm going to affirm, it takes a little bit of boldness, but that Jesus has got off the boat. I don't think he's in situations like that. Where Jesus is, things grow. Even you persecuted, you couldn't put it down. You persecuted the early church. They were never preaching the word. The thing began to spread and grow. See, that's what happens when Jesus is around. Jesus takes what's given to the one, person, one church who was unfaithful, and he gives it to somebody that will be faithful. Now, this little body of people here, we are better recognized in the world than some really large churches. There's people in several foreign countries that know many of you people by name because they've seen you on live stream and read your writings and heard you. If I was to be asked to make something like that happen. I don't have the faintest idea how to make something like that happen. But here's how it happens. If something ever gets in you, it will get out. And if people around you won't receive it, he'll bring somebody from some far off country who will receive it. That's the way Jesus is. So he told Ephesus, he said, uh, If you don't repent, I'll come and take away your candlestick. Now, why, why did this happen? They left their first love. Why? 
It wasn't because like there's, grace doesn't bring enough. It wasn't because of that. It wasn't because Jesus wasn't interceding enough or didn't mediate effectively. Why did that happen? At some point, Ephesus forgot one of the requirements to even start this life. If a man doesn't forsake all, Jesus said, he cannot, he cannot be my disciple. What does that mean, cannot be my disciple? It means Jesus won't teach you. Jesus won't lead you. Jesus won't bless you. You may say, well, that doesn't sound fair. That's the way it is, whether you like it or not. So that happened. That happened that something else upstaged Jesus. Something became more important than Jesus. And they switched their love. <laughs> not living for him. That caused this first love. I, see, I'm accounting for why someone can leave their first love. How could a church, a whole body of people, leave their love for Christ? I mean, how could this happen? Not living for him. Now, it's hard to live for Christ when you meet with his people for an hour a week. I mean, it's... Anybody else would think it's lunacy if you tried to promote some kind of enterprise and you said, I oh, will just meet once in a while for a short time and everybody be kind and we'll sing some little thoughtless ditties and we'll pretend, you know, nobody in the world would try to build anything that way. But that is, that's what's going on. Now the scriptures are plain about this, about living for Jesus. It's the second Corinthians 5.15. He died for, this is Jesus, he died for all. That, that, in order that, they should live, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that loved, that died for them and rose again. See? At the point you start living in your primary interest is yourself. See, this is why people forsake the assembling and things like this. They're living for themselves. But Jesus died and rose again, so you would not do that. Yes. Which means that Jesus has the power to help you in this area, so you won't do that. You won't just live for yourself. You live for him that died for you and rose again. That's why he died and why he rose. And if a person is not living for Christ or a church isn't living for Christ, so far as they are concerned, Christ's death was in vain. God forbid. Why does the church leave its first love? They left the stance of one heart and one soul. Now when the church commenced, the scripture says the multitude, we're talking about a multitude here now. If you in the, ever go to the Middle East, it'll define for you what multitude. <laughs> what multitude means. You see, that's a hard word to define here unless you're talking like about a rock concert or a political rally. Multitude. But you go over there, multitude. When I was in India, used to thousands of people would follow me in a procession. Unbelievable. In fact, I thought seriously at the time of locating in India. But as you know, I didn't but when the early church started, the multitude, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, one soul. They all thought alike. They all had the same love. They all judged things alike. That's what, that's what happened when Jesus really converts some people. As a matter of fact, none of them said the things that they had, they possessed with their own, they had all things common. So the early church thousands of people had swept in to keep the Passover, and they, they estimate that there was some three to five million people come to the Jerusalem to observe the Passover. And after the day of Pentecost, a lot of these people got converted, and they didn't go back home. They stayed in Jerusalem. And so now we had a food problem, and so the early church, they just, some of them sold their properties, and they brought things in. They took one heart, one soul. Somewhere along the line, this ceased. 
And I'm going to tell you, brethren, that uh, the way the modern church is set up is not conducive to this type of thing. The only time the church is together, and then it's not always, it's when they're singing a song. And then, even then, they're not all together. But this has got to happen. If what, what happens, if this doesn't happen, if this happen, doesn't happen, pretty soon, love for Christ will wane. Now, before I close, I want to, I want to make an observation about being meticulous about what other people teach. Now, it's necessary. We, I don't criticize this. Understand. But if you do not temper that with a preeminent love for Christ, and now you give this a test and see if you, if you were ever caught in this, and I was caught in this syndrome myself. If you were ever caught in this about being really a stickler for right things, it causes your love for Christ to diminish, and you have to really be sharp for that not to happen. So if you're part of something that says, oh, we're, the, we're the one true church, that's what we are. Anyone that doesn't see it like we do, that's what Ephesus did. Now they've tried them and said they were apostles. But that sort of thrust, I'm talking about a thrust now, that sort of thrust will cause your love for Christ to wane. Yeah. Yeah. It'll de-emotionalize you. Yeah. I know this happened to me. I, I know what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. But when you have a preeminent love for Christ, you will make all these judgments from a completely different perspective. Yes. Yes. Completely different perspective. So the church in Ephesus, <laughs> there you have it. You know something about an entire church. The rest of the world knows about it. And someday, God's going to know about us. Uh, the world's going to know about us. That's what the day of judgment. See, the same thing's going to happen. Amen. This same thing's going to happen the day of judgment. Every church is going to be evaluated. So God's going to evaluate individuals. Yeah. He's going to evaluate churches. He's even going to evaluate nations. Yeah. Hmm? And so now is the time, by the grace of God, to uh, prepare for that. All the things that are right that Ephesus did, do them. But don't let those things rob you of your love for Christ. Keep that preeminent. And when you're tempted to defer to something other than Christ, kill that thing and do it right away.